no two people with ADHD probably have the exact same fingerprint either. So they may have different combinations of these polygenic risks. Therefore, ADHD exists on a continuum. It's not a yes, you have it. No, you don't. Welcome to FemPower Health. This is Georgie. In today's episode, we dive into the often overlooked topic of ADHD in women. Joined by Dr. Margaret Sibley, an expert in psychiatry and behavioral science, we explore why ADHD is not just a childhood condition, how it uniquely affects women, and the profound impact of hormonal changes. We'll arm you with the strategies to manage symptoms and navigate healthcare. If you're seeking answers and empowerment in your health journey, this episode is for you. Hi, Dr. Sibley. Welcome to FemPower Health. I am so unbelievably excited to have this conversation with you about ADHD in women. It is so, so needed. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really glad we're going to have this conversation today. I have so much empathy for people who struggle with all of these various mental health conditions. And so I really appreciate you saying yes, because even when I posted that I'll be doing this interview, people were on social media asking me all sorts of questions. So clearly it is a timely topic. It's definitely a timely topic and it's awesome that you're going to cover it. So before we dive in, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll start talking about all those questions that everyone has. Well, hi everyone. I'm Maggie Sibley. I am a clinical psychologist and I'm also a professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington School of Medicine. So I'm located in Seattle and um, I'm a researcher by most hours of my work week and I research ADHD in... um, people over 12. So when I started um, in this field about 15 years ago, even just wanting to research ADHD in adolescence was pretty um, cutting edge because mostly we worked with children. And then um, over the last 20 years or so, it's become even um, clearer that ADHD persists across the life into adulthood. And so my work has also been looking at ADHD in, in adults as well. So trying to understand when kids with ADHD grow up, what kinds of problems are they facing? What's their life like? And what can they do to succeed? Why do you think there is this myth that it's just for kids? Like, you know, I, I, I feel like in the, in the recent past, um, apparently a lot of adults were taking it, which has now created a shortage. And then you move into later stages of life of menopause and it's, oh no, it's anxiety. And so there's all these like, no, but it's boys. No, but it's girls. No, it's both. It's just all this stuff. And so I guess maybe, can you just lay the foundation of, what we know to date in ADHD, and obviously let's focus more so on the women, but I don't know if there's like a holistic picture that we should summarize just to set all these facts straight. That's a great idea. And you're right. It's it's like a whole swamp of uh, facts that people aren't sure what's true and what's not true. And our field is learning so much every year with respect to adult ADHD that it's it's hard even for me as a person who does this as my day job to stay on top of it all. The reason that we thought of ADHD originally as a childhood disorder was because the first people to come to clinical attention for these symptoms were boys in the 1950s, 1960s, who were um, phrased having a hyperkinetic disorder. So essentially their hyperactivity was annoying other people, teachers, parents, and they were being brought into a clinic to see if there was anything we could do to get them to calm down. And so that's where ADHD was born. It was sent, it was observations in clinics of boys who um, were showing a lot of external behaviors. And slowly, as we learned more about those boys, we started to realize that related to those external behaviors was a lot of internal behaviors as well, Um, inattention, issues with motivation, executive functioning, And so then suddenly when we expanded the definition of ADHD, other people started to um, come into the fold who maybe didn't have those external behaviors, but had some of those internal ones. And that's when we first started realizing ADHD is also in girls and not just in boys. And ADHD is in people who are over 12. And it took decades of research with children with ADHD following them as they grew up. These samples were often started in the 1980s and 1990s. And then, you know, 20 years later, we start to be able to actually see who they were as adults to be able to ring some bells and say, wait a minute, 
folks, these kids who had ADHD, they still have those symptoms when they're in their 20s, when they're in their 30s. And when those research studies studies started coming out in the 90s, people started coming forward and saying, hey, I recognize that in myself. And we really got this concept that there is adult ADHD because most people with ADHD as children continue to have those symptoms as adults. And furthermore, there were people who had mild ADHD as children that wasn't caught that had worsening problems as adults that were sort of first identified not as children, but adults that were starting to see symptoms in themselves and say, wait a second, I think I have this. And so this has been going on for the last 20 or 30 years. But as you alluded to, um, there's been a real wave of eye-opening um, self-diagnosis and people coming forward to get help for ADHD since the pandemic as well. I don't know if we start with differentiating ADHD, anxiety, executive function. Well, let's dive into it. So okay. um, here's the really important place to start. ADHD is a polygenic disorder. It has biological origins and polygenic means that there's not one gene for ADHD that if you have it, you have ADHD, but rather there's a lot of little gene expressions that all add up. And if you have enough of them, you are going to experience uh, symptoms that are like ADHD. Okay. No two people with ADHD probably have the exact same fingerprint either. So they may have different combinations of these polygenic risks. And so the other part of that is therefore ADHD exists on a continuum. It's not a yes, you have it. No, you don't um, type of uh, condition. So we have people with very high genetic loadings who are likely to express their symptoms early in life and every day of their life and experience a very severe form of ADHD. We have people with moderate genetic loadings who may sometimes really feel like their um, symptoms have been exacerbated and they really feel like they're living a life like a person with ADHD, but there may be other times in their life where their circumstances are different. Their biologies may be different. We can talk about how that relates to hormones and um, that may lead a person to not always look or feel like they have ADHD, but sometimes they do or that they may have a mild, very mild form of it that doesn't even necessarily warrant medical attention. And then you've got people who have very low genetic risk for ADHD, and therefore they really never experience those symptoms. Although what we do know from research is that the average person, it has one or two symptoms of ADHD. So it's likely that every single one of your listeners can relate to at least one symptom on the 18 lists of symptoms that are um, in the the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that we have to follow. So it's something that's relatable. And because it's relatable, it's really easy to convince yourself that you have it. And concentration difficulties are the second most common symptom of any mental disorder, which means if you have anxiety, you have concentration difficulties. If you have depression, you have concentration difficulties. And also there's physical health conditions that can lead to concentration difficulties. One of the things that we would be looking for as providers is, is there a lifespan history of this? So if, uh, because it's biological in origin and ADHD is considered a chronic condition, much like diabetes, something that you kind of have all your life, but sometimes it's Uh, flares up and sometimes it doesn't. We are looking for that. So if somebody is experiencing cognitive challenges for the first time in the perimenopausal period or menopausal period, then, you know, we're thinking to ourselves, we have to rule out two possibilities. One is that, yes, it is known that when estrogen declines, that one, some people experience difficulties, especially with executive functioning um, or other types of cognitive um, control symptoms at that period in their life, if you have ADHD or if you don't have ADHD. So that's a possible explanation for it. But we also know that people with maybe a moderate genetic load for ADHD who've always kind of had a little bit of difficulty in this area, but not something that caused them major problems in their life, if you add the experience of um, perimenopause on top of that, then you might get someone who's suddenly feeling like they have the full syndrome of ADHD. And we also know that anxiety is secondary to ADHD for many people. So um, if you have ADHD, you're going to walk through your life getting more negative feedback from other people and feeling like you make more mistakes and feeling like you're not as good as other people because when you try hard, you don't always succeed. And, and that gives you anxiety, you know, so it's really hard to say, yes, it's anxiety. 
and know it's not ADHD. Um, our best clue is to go back and to learn what you've been like your whole life history and have these problems been there in some form all along, or is this sort of a spontaneous new set of problems that occurred, you know, as you were going through a hormonal transition? It's it's so interesting to talk to all these experts about these various mental health conditions. So like, I think about my own journey and, um, you know, some have asked me like, what are some of the things that you do and you've experienced? And so I feel like I was always this hyper-focused person and I still am, but the ability to concentrate has grown more and more difficult as I've aged. And I actually started taking Wellbutrin in the mornings and that has significantly helped, but then it became too much. So now I go every other day, but then what was also interesting, if I play tennis in the morning, I can't, I play cardio tennis where they're constantly switching the instructions. I can't follow. I'm just like, it becomes so overwhelming. And so my doctor and I have a rule of thumb, take it every other day, but on mornings of tennis, I have to take it because I literally can't even listen to the instructions. You know, I'm listening to this because I hear not even just with ADHD, but generally with these hormone changes, like maybe taking menopause hormone therapy like estrogen would be helpful for a lot of these mental health conditions, but a lot of women are being prescribed specific mental health medications. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm just listening to now what you're saying with these hormonal transitions, because as you know, perimenopause could be 10 years. So I'm thinking anyone who's listening, who's 35 or over, you know, this whole nuance of changes is relevant for you. So I guess, how do, I mean, do you guys have estrogen as part of your packet? Because I know psychiatrists don't prescribe estrogen. They would say, go to your OBGYN. So now how do you holistically figure that out? Yeah. So a couple things. First of all, you're right. And there was a survey done a couple years ago of thousands of uh, women and um, by the Attitude magazine, which is an ADHD centric magazine, online um, news media. And they found that among um, women with ADHD who are over 50, they reported that the, the most severe or the most challenging period of life for them for their symptoms was between age 40 and 60 which is so interesting. So it seems like that's actually the hardest period of life for women who have ADHD. What I would say probably whether you have a full form of ADHD or like a subthreshold, milder, kind of moderate load ADHD, you know, that is valid what you've what you and probably some of your listeners are experiencing. As far as it goes with treatment options, There are no research studies, at least that I'm aware of, that look at hormone replacement therapy as a treatment for ADHD in women who are of any age, to be honest. So that is interesting, and that is an obvious gap in the literature. And until there's some science behind it, I think people are going to be hesitant. We're not seeing widespread practice where people are doing that. What we are seeing is um, there's a little bit of research suggesting that stimulant medications that treat ADHD... Um, are effective equally in people with ADHD going through um, perimenopause or menopause and people who are, have like the executive function difficulties that seem specific to uh, reduction of estrogen over time, that those stimulant medications help with those executive function difficulties as well. So you're probably more likely to see somebody be willing to cross over um, and give the stimulant medications for somebody who doesn't have ADHD, then you are the opposite to see people with ADHD um, maybe getting some hormone replacement therapy related to helping with their cognitive symptoms. I would almost rather start hormone therapy and because mm-hmm. there's so many symptoms of menopause, see what happens. And then if I'm not supported, then maybe go to a psychiatrist and say, how else can we help me? I think a lot of people are on the same page as you with that. And, um, you know, when I go to meetings on ADHD, the the women in the room are sort of like coming up to the microphone and saying, why aren't we looking at this? This seems so obvious to us. The big issue that we honestly have in this field is that there is not a lot of people out there or organizations out there that want to fund research on A, adult ADHD, and B, even more women with ADHD and what that experience is. So all of us who like see all these obvious things to research that would potentially lead to huge breakthroughs, 
can only do it if we have millions of dollars, right? Because we have to do it right in order for it to stand up on its own and people to be like, okay, I trust this study. And that is really expensive. So that's the hugest barrier in the field right now, as far as what I see to getting, um, translating some of these obvious good ideas into something that's been tested so that it can be, for example, FDA approved, right? You can't just do it based on logic. You have to do it based on really good studies, really good data to be able to actually have like a green light, like, hey, this actual treatment could be something that we advise, um, not just permit, you know, for people who are experiencing cognitive difficulties, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, whether they have ADHD or not. Recently, uh, President Biden signed over $100 million dollars to ARPA-H, and they have five pillars that they're looking at, and it would be really interesting to see if somehow mental health can be added in unique ways. And then he also signed, I can't remember how many billions of dollars for women's health research specifically, because the challenge, as you know, is unfortunately, healthcare is based on capitalism. And so unless someone is going to be able to make money off of something it's hard to do the research. Like same thing happened. My son has a chronic condition and all the pediatricians were like, good luck because no one wants to fund this. And here are the three options and just try it. And hopefully your son gets better. And there's this really unfair stigma around ADHD that goes all the way up to the level of the government. We in the field of researchers who are kind of committed to work in this area, I believe that the number is something like NIH spent about $5 million last year on adult ADHD research. They spent $700 million on depression research. It's wild. And if you want to just make a a fairer comparison, they spent about $40 million on ADHD research at any age, including childhood, which is where most of it is. So if you want to do that comparison, $40 million on ADHD, $700 on depression. There's a, there's something about ADHD that people, especially in adulthood, don't really want to touch. There's a stigma. There's this, is it really real? We had a really um, amazing meeting in Washington, D.C. in December that the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine held basically so that the federal government, the FDA was there, the NIH was there, could take a look at what is this, what do we need to do with ADHD in this country? So I hope that's sort of like maybe the tides are starting to turn, but you know, for women with ADHD out there, it's so hard because there are things that people know implicitly that because we don't have the science to back them yet, medical professionals like me can't go out there and say this is fact, even if we believe it's probably true. How should we tackle talking about what we know today and being solution oriented about it? Because what do I do to survive? So I'd love to like talk about what we know now and how people should look at it, tools and and just anything else that you think is important to share with where we are today. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what we know. And I think there's a lot of things out there that we suspect that, you know, I'm totally open minded about, but I want to start with what we know. So First of all, um, there are medications for ADHD. There are sort of two broad categories. One is stimulant medications and the other are non-stimulant medications. At this point, you know, there are probably, I would say 30 plus, maybe even 50 plus different formulations of approved medications for for ADHD. They last different amount of hours. You take them at different times a day. They're made of different chemicals. So those medications are really effective for helping kind of, I've heard people with ADHD call it taking the edge off, right? Their symptoms just feel a little bit more under control. They do not, you know, transform you into a person who doesn't have ADHD, but they they just help you sort of get through the day. So that's one option that people who suspect that they have ADHD can talk to their healthcare providers about. The other side of this is the day-to-day life side. And so medications don't solve all the problems. They just sort of help you kind of like be able to like maybe get yourself to do a little bit more. Where we started with the daily life stuff was in the psychology world. Um, Psychologists like me do cognitive behavioral therapy. It's sort of the main kind of uh, best practice in, in therapy for people with Um, diagnosable um, psychiatric conditions for all kinds of um, conditions, depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorders. And so, you know, about 20 years ago, people took those approaches and brought them into the ADHD world. And there's effectiveness there, right? So helping people 
learn strategies to overcome procrastination, for example, helping people learn to structure their days in ways that set them up to succeed. Um, And then talking with um, a therapist about bigger picture questions, like what kind of career is a fit for me? Where do I feel like my strengths are going to be valued? How can I set up my life so that my ADHD doesn't get in the way of the things that I need to accomplish to be a happy, healthy person? Um, Here's an analogy that I love that I didn't come up with. Part of the journey of having ADHD is learning to write your own owner's manual. So being able to understand yourself and be the best pilot of yourself, right? You know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And you really have to be able to like harness that. So that's how I would sum up the work you might do with a therapist doing CBT. Beyond that, we know that though not necessarily a treatment for ADHD, there are um, health benefits that seem to impact cognition for um, physical activity level and eating a healthy diet. So part of care for ADHD also involves thinking about lifestyle making sure you're getting enough activity level, making sure you're eating healthy foods, trying to sleep, you know, as best as you can enough, um, setting limits on screen time. That's a big um, area of challenge for adults with ADHD is overuse or misuse of digital media. So being able to like learn to set limits on that. You know, I think for people with ADHD, uh, there's a, a risk for overuse and misuse of substances as well. Um, And so being able to sort of like as part of writing your own owner's manual, know what amount and what types of substances are okay and not okay for you. So this is all sort of the work that we help people with ADHD do. But honestly, it's a it's got to be self-empowerment. I think really only people know themselves and they know what they need. And as professionals, we're just here to try to guide them to figure that out for themselves. And it can be a long journey. Right. Now, I'd love to start with the strategic perspective, which was like career and like writing your own journey. So Mm -hmm. I guess just for those who are listening to and are like, career, are you kidding me? Like, can you talk, like shed some light on that? Because Googling did not necessarily make me feel that much better. (laughs) Well, it's interesting. So there have been like studies where we interview people with ADHD about like what characteristics of jobs seem to help them most. So it's not necessarily, everyone always wants to know, like, what's a good career for a person with ADHD? It's not that simple, because what's a good career for a person is the sum of all of their strengths and all of their weaknesses, of which ADHD is just one tiny piece of that. So it never really works out that way. But some of the features of jobs that seem to come out in these interviews in common are um, highly stimulating in a field that you're naturally interested in. And something that may have kind of like immediate um, rewards. So for example, some people think that their ADHD makes them a good fit for sales because there's sort of that immediate, like, I sell this, I get this money, right? And, and not everyone, but some people will say something like that. What kind of sales? That depends on all kinds of other things that are who you are and what you're interested in. Some people with ADHD say that they... Uh, do really good in culinary. They love the fast paced kitchen, right? Because it's like a million things going on at once and it's highly stimulating. If you don't like food, why would you want to be in that job, right? So it really depends both on who you are. But looking at the features of jobs that I think people need to look back and sort of say like, when were the places and times in my life where I felt like the best version of myself? And what was it about that place and time that made me feel like that? And how can I replicate that in other places? So yeah, you may have a job that you're in a career that you're kind of locked into and no one's saying that you need to change that, but are there ways that you can modify your day or how things work for you or your workflow to kind of achieve some of those features that seem to be important to you doing your best? So it's an individual conversation with people. Interesting. Yeah, I've noticed things like for me, getting outside first thing in the morning, or just any fresh air. Um, I started I just started training for the New York City Marathon, the running the intensity of the running I noticed slows my brain down, um, and kind of settles me and doing the things I don't want to do most first thing in the morning. And then having plenty Mm -hmm. of thinking time, like I can't do it quickly, but then some things the pressure of a deadline Mm -hmm. is also helping me focus. Are there tips and tricks that either are that commonly work for people or things that you may not necessarily find on the internet that people would be surprised could be helpful or how do people, I don't know. Well, okay. So one precursor to this question, (laughs) 18 symptoms of ADHD and 
super heterogeneous disorder, which means that no, like, you know, two people have the same version of ADHD, which makes it really hard to come up with these like across the board hacks for ADHD, because somebody may have an ADHD that's very like reward sensitivity oriented, which means that they like, you know, are really distractible because things that they like get their attention all the time. Right. And they have a hard time, like with self-control and they have a hard time with um, like being able to say no to the social media that's interesting to them. And they have a hard time being able to keep doing things that aren't rewarding, like really boring work. But then you have other people who don't have that aspect of it at all. They just sort of have this brain fog experience where they just sort of feel really inattentive and they just sort of can't, you know, get themselves to like do things and um, they feel foggy and unmotivated. And that may be a really different experience of ADHD. They'll say yes to some of the same symptoms on the ADHD checklist, but they won't say yes to all of them. So um, part of it is sort of understanding yourself and understanding which aspects of ADHD am I struggling with. And then um, it's a trial and error approach. A lot of things on the internet are good ideas. Um, So for example, like we talk about the executive function aspect of ADHD is often manifested as problems organizing information, problems organizing your time problems organizing your materials. So um, we might help people do things like find a home for everything in your house so that you can, people who are struggling with messiness, right? Like be able to be able to put everything back and know what that looks like. For people trouble with information management and forgetfulness, we might be working on, I can't, there aren't brain training programs out there that make people have more efficient minds, you know, in the research, but I can teach you that if you're a forgetful person, you need to learn to write everything down. Right. And you just have to be that kind of person who writes down everything. That's the type of thing that if we can hone in on what the actual symptom is, that's causing you the problem. We go for a specific solution for that symptom, but there's 18 of them. So it's really different for people with trouble with self-control and impulsivity. We might be working on um, deliberately keeping yourself out of a situation where you have trouble with self-control because you know that at this point in your life, you're not ready to like inhibit or stop yourself, you know, from saying yes to something. In women, we see um, a lot more people reporting difficulties with emotional impulsivity, interpersonal impulsivity. So this is a big flavor of ADHD in women is trouble with interpersonally growing up, just sort of feeling like... Either you did things that you were like thought were stupid after the fact and you're like getting down on yourself like that, or that you um, are having trouble like getting motivated to approach so- social situations so you don't engage with people as much. Um, so there's a lot of your listeners who have ADHD might resonate with more of that social piece. And that's like a whole different set of strategies than the sort of like, you know, um, work related organization, time management planning than that like a lot of people think of when they think of ADHD. So what are some strategies? That's a unique one that I hadn't really heard about. So what might be examples there? This is like a really um, unexplored world. So (laughs) I I will not have the answers. I hope in 10 years we have more answers to this, right? But what I will say is that people with ADHD need to surround themselves with the right people. You need to surround yourselves with people who see something in you that they value. And you need to like, those are the, those should be your people. And a lot of times people with ADHD, um, you know, that I've worked with report having an easier time um, with uh, interacting with people that they share common interests with. And that it's easier to sort of socially interact when you have something like built in to talk about and do together than trying to deal with small talk and entering conversations and the unstructured social can be a lot more complicated for people with ADHD than the structured social. So I would say that's a starting place, but that's not going to solve everyone's problems. I don't think I've seen it broken down in all of these different aspects. Um, and quite honestly, this last example you gave, I never would have thought is a part of ADHD. I bet you, your listeners are going to resonate with that. It's the social for girls. It's the emotional for girls. It's self-esteem for women. You know, really? yes, everyone's going to tell you because if you have ADHD um, and you're growing up with probably an undiagnosed ADHD that people around you don't realize that you're struggling with something and think that you're just like, aren't as good as other people. And that's the feedback you're getting that hurts, you know, and over years and years, people with ADHD are, especially women are known to, you know, really develop a lot of trouble with self-esteem over the years. So this might not be the experience of some of your listeners who are experiencing late in life, executive 
function problems for the first time in their 50s versus someone who's been struggling with this since they were six, right? So they're not going to have a lifetime of um, developing these self-esteem problems because they they did well in life, you know, up until the point where they kind of got hit by perimenopause or, or whatever that might be. So these are other ways that we can, as clinicians, like talk to people, hear their life stories and try you kind of differentiate a little bit from uh, different um things that might be going on that, as you alluded to, have different implications for treatment, which is the whole point, right? It, for some people, it is feels validating to be able to like self-identify, you know, a, a certain way. And that's important. That psychological benefit of understanding yourself is super important. But for us as medical professionals, um, our main goal is just to get you the right treatment. And so we're just trying to figure out like, what's the, what's the dominant thing going on for you that could be helpful to treat? Right. So- um, I guess one quick question. I don't want to harp on this, but I just want to clarify ADHD versus executive function. Does it matter if we differentiate the two diagnoses and in what way would it, if it does matter? Okay. So if you think about a ADHD as a giant circle, executive functioning is a little circle in that giant circle. So, um, People with ADHD don't always experience executive function difficulties. Um, ADHD is something that mostly seems to um, emerge from the way that the dopamine receptors and transmission in the brain are regulated and act. And that, you know, the genes that I alluded to at the beginning of this conversation that are implicated in ADHD tend to be genes that end up coding for proteins that are the building blocks of certain areas of your brain related to reward sensitivity. Because of that, there's a part of the, there are two parts of the brain that are implicated in that most strongly. The prefrontal cortex, which is your control center where you sort of like are your own pilot and, um, you know, have certain abilities to sort of like goal set, organize, um, working memory, which is a, our capacity to sort of like do things um, on the spot thinking wise as part of a complex task. And then the reward centers in the brain, which are in the middle of your brain, this is where dopamine comes in. And people are familiar nowadays with dopamine because we talk a lot about it with digital media, right? So like essentially when an, when an average person um, see something that they're interested in, in anticipation of doing that thing, they get their dopamine will increase in the brain because that's the pleasure chemical. So, oh, I'm excited. I want to go see that movie. You know, I get a little hit of dopamine. For people with ADHD, part of the reason um, that they experience motivation difficulties is sometimes they're not getting enough dopamine to activate them to do something. And sometimes they're getting too much and they can't stop doing something they like, like playing a video game. You know, a lot of the kids I work with, super, you know, brain saturated with dopamine, can't get off of it, right? So this is dysregulation of the dopamine systems. Now, estrogen um, does bind with dopamine receptors. And there is a relationship there with estrogen and dopamine in the brain, which is why you see when estrogen decreases, there's also um, sort of a decrease in the dopaminergic activity that sometimes, not for everyone, can occur. And that can manifest as an executive function problem. But that is specific to what estrogen is doing. Whereas people with ADHD, their whole dopamine system is a lot more impacted. There are some um, medications, for example, to treat ADHD that are not acting on dopamine as its central mechanism. And those probably wouldn't help with people who are experiencing um, the estrogen related executive function difficulties, because we think those are largely because of the way that estrogen interacts with dopamine um, in the brain. We don't know for sure, but if that's the hypothesis, you wouldn't expect um, a medication that is working on a different neurotransmitter to necessarily help the folks, you know, with that specific difficulty. So um, yeah, it's just a part of what people with ADHD deal with. I'm just curious on your reaction on how important these baseline things are to this population. In theory, it's really important, but we also have to acknowledge that these baseline things are harder for people who struggle with ADHD to get under control than other people. And so it's a lot to say, like, if you could just get this under control, your life would be better. (laughs) So people with ADHD are at risk for dysregulated sleep, especially in the middle of the night. People with ADHD on average, their brain wants them to go to bed later on average, not all. Um, And so, you know, they but then they still have to get up early for work in the morning. So it's tough. You know, same with exercise. If you have trouble getting yourself motivated to do aversive things, unless you find a form of exercise that you're super excited about, that's super interesting and fun to you, 
it's going to be hard to do the day to day. We here's a finding that also relates to the estrogen um, decline related like executive function issues for across the cycle. We didn't really talk about that, but across the cycle, the menstrual cycle, there's also um, research suggesting that during the premenstrual phase, which is when estrogen is lower, women with ADHD experience worse symptoms in that week than the other weeks of their cycle. And one of the things they experience is a preference for immediate rewards during that week. And so if we extended that research, which, you know, this is a, this is a, a little bit of a leap, but if that same finding were there for people across the lifespan that, you know, as estrogen gets lower, um, over time um, in women that they would have that same preference for immediate rewards. That means it's harder to delay gratification. So um, in that week of the menstrual cycle, that means that people might feel more drawn into their, you know, their social media, their immediate reinforcing um, digital stuff. They might feel cravings to eat things that are high in fats and sugar because they are preference for immediate rewards. So if you're trying to tell a person who's having these biological barriers, essentially, to getting their life life like well regulated to get their life well regulated it's tough so i just need to acknowledge that a lot of optimizing our healthcare is knowing the nuance of what to share with our clinicians like the tennis example i gave you like i called my doctor and i'm like i'm not able to focus anymore cuz she had me switch to every other day of the wellbutrin and she and because i happened to tell her she's like you need to take it the mornings you play tennis but i normally would not have thought to tell her. And so I just find it really interesting that how we prepare for our doctor appointments, what we track really helps our clinicians better help us. So do you have tips on what we should be monitoring? To the extent that you can, you find a doctor who's going to listen is really important. And um, in our field, people with ADHD are complicated. Women with ADHD are hormonally complex, which makes their ADHD even more complicated than the ADHD of a man, I would say. And so really finding a provider who's well-trained in ADHD, they'll make it easier to elicit from you what's important. And okay. because you're right, it's so hard to like know what's relevant. Usually you want to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist if you're if you're a woman, you know, over 30 who's never been diagnosed with ADHD and you're questioning it, you're going to be a comp- you're probably going to be a complex diagnostic puzzle for someone like me unless it was it's so clear and for some reason you were just missed. Sometimes it's not complex, but if you think you're complex, go talk to someone who's going to give you an hour of their time, not 15 minutes of their time. I think that's really important. And then the scoring, so because anytime there's ever been tests done, there's always that sheet you fill out, give it to people around you and everyone scores it. And then it gets, goes to the doctor as like step one. Are there any other like foundational things of like, if a clinician's not doing this, you probably want to move on. Like any other. Yeah. If they only give you that checklist and then give you a diagnosis, move on. Because okay. the hardest part about diagnosing ADHD in adults is differential diagnosis, which you started with. Is it anxiety? Is it hormones? Is it something else? And so it's easy to give that checklist. That's important. But but we need to establish, A, that these difficulties are actually impacting your life, that they're not just slight personality traits that are quirks about you, but really giving you a hard time and require medical attention. Not every, Just that checklist doesn't tell you that. Okay. Then you need someone who can ask about your health history, ask about your other mental health history, pieces of your mental health, you know, to really puzzle it all together and figure out like, it's detective work. So, you know, what, what is this person's story? What best explains their experiences and then what treatment would be best for them? So, um, yes, you want someone who's going to interview you for at least an hour, I would say, before they make an ADHD diagnosis. Otherwise, that's a red flag. One other favorite I've been doing on FemPower Health is I'm discovering all these lists of subspecialist experts. And I have a find a doctor page on the website where I list all of them. Is there one for ADHD where we can my zip code find someone who is an expert or is there another tool that people can use that I can point them to? To my knowledge, the best database of this is held through CHAD, Children children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, C-H-A-D-D. Okay. And that is sort of the, the advocacy organization for ADHD. Okay. Try out a few people. Okay. Wow. This has been... So awesome. Um, I really, I, I'm sure that people get so much value out of this. I know I did as well. And it's just, it's comforting to know that it's 
complex and trial and error, but I feel like you gave us enough buckets of information and how to frame this, that it should give people a good start. And, you know, unfortunately there isn't a magic bullet. Um, it is really trial and error. So I re- appreciate yeah. you sharing that. How would you like people to, I guess, find you or stay in touch? Is there, do you have any asks of, of the community who's listening? No asks of the community who's listening, but if you want to find me, you know, I have a website, www.margaretsibley.com. So it's easy to find me there. And I have a way of communicating me with, with me through there. If you really want to advocate, you know, for ADHD and your, um, you know, there are organizations who organize advocacy. I mentioned Chad. There's ADA, A-D-D-A. That's the, um, that's the main support group organization for people with ADHD. And they have affinity groups within that. So check that out too, because they have online Zoom sessions where people can kind of connect with each other and talk. And that's a great organization as well. Um, so you can check them out. And advocate to your politicians and the the rich people you know that ADHD, you know, researchers need money so that we can turn what you know into fact and turn fact into science and science becomes our new medical practices. So, you know, this is where I sort of think that we need the most sort of help in our field. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And for those listening, I'll put the links to everything in the show notes. You can check that out. Um, but thank you so much for your time and, and dedication and expertise. I'm so glad my friend called me about you because this was mm-hmm. enlightening and, and really important to cover. Definitely. And I enjoyed this conversation. So thanks for all the work you're doing, too.